This is 3MP's Sunday Celebrations. I want to talk about family history for a second and, and, and just to rewind a few years and talk about young William Bond growing up in Melbourne. And one of the things that I, I think when, I was, um, when we were chatting and looking into the William Bond story, you had an incredible early life, both, both with your father being involved in the wine industry, and we'll come back to that uh, you know, uh, yeah. later on, Yes. But also about your work with Channel 9 and everything that you did, you had really quite a, a fascinating early part of your life. Yeah, I was very privileged. I had uh, two wonderful parents and uh, um, that obviously when you get older and you look back in your life, you think, how blessed was I to have that, that relationship with my parents? Um, they did everything they possibly could and they weren't wealthy people at all. Dad was in advertising. Uh, used to go to Jimmy Watson's in Carlton for lunch on a Friday. Henceforth was asked by Jimmy Watson to be a, a judge on the um, on the Jimmy Watson Trophy each year at the Royal Show, and so that's kind of how it started. Yeah. yeah. But uh, no, Dad was great. We um, he uh, as a young, very young boy, I started hitting saucepans, and so the next thing arrived was a, a set of drums, and that's kind of how I got into the music sort of side of it and love the music side of it, uh, and then. I remember as sort of growing up, every Friday, Dad would come home in the Zephyr station wagon and uh, we'd load up the car and head down to Sorrento mm. uh, and stay at the, because Grandpa and Grandma lived down at Sorrento and uh, in fact, Grandpa was a builder down there. And he built a lot of the sandstone houses at Sorrento, which you see down there, yeah. uh, which was the classics of the old veranda and with the veranda right round the house. Um, that's what he, he did all his life. and. Uh, and then on Monday or Sunday night, we'd come home again. And the following Friday afternoon, we'd head in the Zephyr station wagon and drive down again. So it was quite a, quite a classic event. Well, I'll come and, to the wine thing, but, but the drumming thing, I'm really keen to explore a bit of that because sure. I know it was, it was um, you know, late 60s, early 70s, I think, playing with a number of bands in, in Melbourne. And yes. one of them particularly was quite a regular staple at the Shindig at the Morty Alec. Uh, uh, Zephyr Saving Club, club. yes it, it was Were you part of all of that? Because that's quite a famous venue back in the day it, I was, Paul McKay Sound was, I was the drummer for the Paul In fact the second drummer for the Paul McKay Sound And every Sunday night we played at Shindig yeah. And uh, we'd have guest bands from you know, Daddy Cool to Blue Stone To a whole range of different types of Even John Farnham used to come down and say Cool, can I have a sting? <laughs> 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 sure, John, jump on <laughs> So it was quite an experience playing down there. Uh, and it was good. We had some very, very happy years playing with that band. Uh, they, we had five singles in the top 40 at one stage. Uh, mm. We're on shows like Commotion and those types of shows and, uh, that were on, on television back in the early days. And, uh, and there was a dating game with Greg Evans that I was on also when I was a single man and uh, I was one of the things on that show. One so of the which, guys was that? which dating game was that? Uh, it was great, um, um, perfect match. Oh, you were on perfect match. Yeah, <laughs> classic. Oh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's what I've been doing. Wish we could find that vision. I, I wish I could. I wish I could. In fact, I had a lot of that vision, but we were robbed years ago, and uh, all those tapes I had were gone. Um, uh, because again, uh, I did some work on Channel Ten on Hey Hey, uh, not Hey Hey, yet on uh, Good Morning Melbourne. Mm -hmm. with Annette Allison and Roy Hampson. Yeah, yeah. Remember those days? Oh, absolutely. And Ted Dunn was producing the show, which, yeah. my, now, which my wife was uh, one of the researchers on the show. So every time they wanted to bring something on, so like a cake on, on, on set, um, they'd call me in and I'd bring the cake on set and, or this or flowers for someone or whatever. So it was quite, uh, quite interesting growing up. So you, went to, you went on a dating show, but then, then obviously found your now wife at work. I did at Channel 9. Uh, yes, I did at uh, my tender age of uh, 17 when my father went to war with Norm Spencer, who was producing IMT. And Norm and Dad were war buddies. And uh, I was very much into sport at school, but not and creative sort of aspect and kind of didn't like the rest. And so my father said, what are you going to do in your life? I said, well, I don't know, I did something creative, Dad, I want to do and sport and because I was very keen on football and um, played a lot of first footy at school with you know guys like uh, David Ellis and uh, Manzi, uh, John Manzi, ex Aguda guys. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ross Smith was a year ahead of us and he was in the team. So I kind of played a lot of that sort of football. Uh, but then Dad said, look, 
I'll ring Norm and ask if he can get a job at Channel 9 for you. I'll talk about yeah. the Channel 9 era because some of the shows that you're a, um, a cameraman and, and a lot of other yes. things, I guess, at Channel 9. Yeah, indeed. But, but when you read through and you see people refer to the fact that they were working on shows like in Melbourne Tonight, for example, which is possibly one of the most iconic TV shows in Melbourne history, in Australian television history, um, but also new faces and you've worked with <sighs> Sarah Pierce. And I mean, it's just such a, a wonderful period of Australian television. It was a, a magnificent time and, and gosh, it was fun. It was, I mean, for a young kid, I started off with the film department at Channel 9 because in those days there was no videotape. Uh, it was all 16 mil film and I used to have to splice the commercials in to all the shows because all the shows came in 16 mil. You had so your free handy with a Chinograph pencil in? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, but when I was at my desk, which was pretty high in the stool, I used to splice the film. I was looking at this gorgeous lady who was, um, John McLaughlin was the head of the film department at Channel 9 and uh, his PA was uh, a lady called Faye Tinsley and I thought she was absolutely gorgeous. And 40, uh, nearly 46 years later, we're still together. <laughs> oh, a wonderful story of a workplace romance. Which, it is. Which, uh, no, Channel, Channel 9 was a great place. But IMT was, 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 I mean, what a thrill that was. Uh, I was on, when you first started production, uh, you started as cable man or cable boy, uh, where you've got your jeans and t-shirt on you and make sure all the cables from the cameras, camera one, two and three, camera one was Graham, camera two was the, the crane, which they pulled up and down for the big high shots, and camera three. Um, my role was to make sure the cables didn't get tangled up together as they're moving around. Yeah. But instead of wearing jeans and a t-shirt, I, uh, I wore a three-piece suit. Right, because so, I really wanted, I really wanted to get on and be noticed. They always say, uh, you know, dress for the job you want, not the one you have. So yeah. exactly, and and at the same time, my my first car, my father was very gracious and bought me my first car, which we bought off an old TPI pensioner, which is an old Mercedes, an old two twenty Mercedes with the running boards and the headlights used to pop up at the top on the front, and I used to park that in the car park and. Next minute, Graham Kennedy was given a white Mercedes and he'd park right next to me. And because he kept asking, who's that, who's that young kid with the, with the three-piece suit on? <laughs> and next minute, I'm doing Night Owl Theatre with Hal Todd on cameras uh, with my mate Billy Templer. And uh, the, the phone rang at Switchboard and, and the Switchboard said, William, come to, come to the front, there's a call for you. Uh, and I said, oh, okay. So I got there and, and I said, hello. And he goes, Oh, William, it's uh, Graham Kennedy. I go, oh, what have I done? <laughs> so, you know, have I been fired or <laughs> whatever? So he said, no, no. He said, um, he said I'd, I'd like to speak to you or I'll meet with you. I said, oh, okay. And uh, he said, look, um, my house, I'm not at Frank's because the house burnt down, but I'm running a property at Hawthorne. And he said, uh, what, what time do you finish? And I said, well, we finish at 12 o'clock. And he said, well, come around and I'd, I'd like to have a chat to you. I, Oh, okay, okay, okay. Gave me the dress. Went back to the studio with Bill and said, Bill, Graham Kennedy wants to see me. God, I have, am I okay? Am we going to be fired? Or Because you, you thought he'd owned the station because he was so famous. He was the king. Anyhow, we go around and see Graham and, and he offered me a job to work as his PA. And uh, I, I got home about four in the morning after a few drinks and, and, uh, and I told mum and dad and dad said, well, make sure, talk to Norm and uh, make sure that if it doesn't work that, you can have your job back at Channel 9. I said, oh, okay. So, so uh, great period of your life. And I want to just maybe fast forward through a little bit. Through yeah, sure. Late 1970s, not, not too far, but late 1970s, early 1980s. And you spent some time in Hobart um, at a time when Rest Point was only, what well, was less than 10 years old. Um, so it was yes. still a real, I mean, it still is a huge thing. But back then, it was the thing, the only casino in Australia. But you, you, um, you had the management rights of the Traveller's Rest Hotel, which was a magnificent, was a magnificent place, particularly back yeah. in the day. It was. It was a university pub. My, my accountant yeah. rang me one day because I had a restaurant in Melbourne with a partner called Nookie's, would you believe? And it was in Mitchum. And uh, it was the all-white restaurant with the white grand piano and we had the Carpenters play, <laughs> virtually, meaning a couple from uh, who sounded like the Carpenters. And uh, so he rang me and I said, look, we're forming a syndicate to, um, to, to, to run the hotel down there. Would you be interested? And I said, I'd love to. So um, we went down there and uh, got rid of all the university kids out of there. And they had an old steakhouse there. And we turned that steakhouse into a, 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 a la carte restaurant. 
mm -hmm. um, uh, which was about a 60-seater. And the head chef of the revolving restaurant, which they brought over from France, Robert Dubois, um, used to come in before work every day and have a few beers. And, and he didn't look happy at all. And I said, what's wrong, Robert? He says, um, they got old fashioned manual, you know, <laughs> I want to bring it up a bit. He said, they won't let me. I said, Rob, look, I'm opening a restaurant called Bonds. And what I want to do is have no menu, but uh, every day we change the menu. Well, there are four entrees, six main courses and four dessert. Uh, every day we'll go to the market and we'll change it. So you can eat there seven days a week and not have the same thing twice. Oh, he said, that's fantastic, fantastic. I'll be there. You know, so he joined and... And Robert loved his French champagne, so every time he'd cook in the kitchen, he'd have a French champagne, which he'd, he'd scale himself something and put some in the sauce and mix it around. And, and then we got voted in the, from the age, good food guy, we got voted the top 10 restaurants in Australia, which was, uh, which was sensational. And then, of course, Robert wrote a book, a cookbook, with all, our, all the various dishes that he used to prepare. So moving into Adland now, and um, it was an early yes. part of your life because, I mean, of course, you were selling really quite young and Dad was into sales, of course. But, yeah. but the ad side of things, I mean, you opened your, uh, with some partners, opened the first ad agency. Was it back in 1986, I think, in Melbourne? Yes, yeah, it was. It was, um, it was an interesting time because I was um, kind of floundering a bit in, in what I wanted to do and I still wanted to be that sort of creative aspect. I was, uh, the, I was a marketing director, actually, of uh, Interwest Hotel Group. Uh, when I came back from, from when we got out of the hotel, uh, John Avram uh, then acquired the Chateau Melbourne Hotel in Lonsdale Street and he offered me the job as the marketing director uh, and I had a pr projected occupancy of 10% over a whole year. So we, no one stayed there because they had the old flock wallpaper falling <laughs> off the walls in the rooms and it was a disaster. So we spent about three years with John and uh, we got up to running at about 80% and then we bought a whole bunch of other hotels. and end up marketing about 2,000 rooms a night that I had to, had to fill. And then uh, I kind of completed that mission. I thought, now I need another challenge. And so I rang a mate of mine who was in advertising and said, hey, let's, let's, let's form an agency. And uh, he said, sure. He said, well, I, I know someone, which I knew this other chap who was a creative director who we appointed and made him as a partner. And so we formed our first agency in, uh, in South Melbourne. How much is the? I mean, how much do you think that they were the heady days back in the late eighties, early nineties? It was, yes, uh, it was, yeah. The ad games changed so much over the years. Oh, look, it's totally changed now. Uh, we we had uh, a lot of automotive clients uh, as well. Well, people like Mercedes Benz, for example, retail. Um, we, we had that. Uh, we had Kiwi products, shoe polish, um, various other other clients that we booked. We were trying to pick up uh, a bit from CEB. Uh, one of their brands, uh, and it ended up okay, but it was a different world in those days. It was, it was the days where you could actually ring someone on the phone and get through to the who you wanted to talk to. Mm. Uh, not these days where you're blocked by PAs or you can't get through to anyone and no one rings you back and no one wants to verbally talk to you, they just want to send you emails. So it was those days where you actually had communication. And, I mean, and having a chat with one of those live chat things on a website and realised that Trevor at the other end of the chat isn't actually a human. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, and, and what happened was that you actually got to know the person and they got to know you. So it was a bit about trust um, and a bit about who you had on board and what you've done in the past. We had a, we had a fantastic showreel uh, that uh, was really quite spectacular. Um, and so it kind of blew everyone away and henceforth we picked up a lot of clients. It was all about relationships. It is about relationships. Well, business is about relationships, isn't it, really? I mean, at the end of the day is, do I want to deal with this person or do I trust this person? And if it's yes, well, you, and, and you become mates, you get on really well. And it, uh, that, that's how life is. That's how life is. Be kind and <laughs> people will be kind back to you. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good way of uh, going through life in general, isn't it? It, just, it is. It is indeed. It is indeed. Get back what you put out. Um, so let's move on to wine. Yes. <laughs> Where you play these days. Um, but the wine uh, part of your life, and you touched on a little bit earlier, but the wine part of your life, of your life started really early with your dad. It did. Dad was, um, we lived in, uh, as I said, partly lived in Hampton and, and Sorrento. And dad, because of his dad was a media buyer in advertising with uh, Jackson Wayne, on, which is an old advertising agency many years ago. Mm. And dad was invited to be a, a judge at the Jimmy Watson Trophy. And uh, so I grew up with kind of 
clean boxes under the house which had no labels. It was batch one, batch two, batch three, whatever it was called. And so I guess from the age of 16, Dad used to give me little sips of wine and say, now this is a Shiraz or this is this or um, this is a sparkling, a sepal sparkling burgundy <laughs> in those oh, days. Yep. And he, he described the texture of the flavours to me. So I kind of from a very young age uh, was introduced to wine. Not that I did anything about it at all for long, many, many, many years. Thank you. And, and the only reason I got into wine is because I was doing some consulting for um, a company. Uh, it was a winery in the Yarra Valley. And, uh, and I got them out of the red into the black and, and then they sold it. And I thought, oh, maybe I should do this for myself. So at the time I was doing this other consulting to a startup um, software company. And, and I did some capital raising for them. We raised quite a, a lot of money for them. And I thought, I'll start this off as a hobby job. So I then, being a mad Shiraz man at the time, I found this gorgeous Shiraz called Epsilon from Barossa Valley, which I've still got today on my list. And it was delicious. And so I started with one wine and then on a Friday, because I was concerned, I'd go out Friday afternoon to the restaurants, the pubs and say, hey, oh, Epsilon, this is great wine, have a taste, you know, for it to be good. Yeah, I'll take a dozen, I'll take a dozen, yeah. Next minute, I'm sort of doing this consulting work and next minute, it was getting bigger and bigger, and so then I had to go and find more wines. And then I decided one day, why don't I create a wine called Mr. Bond? Yes. It's a natural. <laughs> so, Absolutely. being my name. Yeah. So, we, I looked around Mornington Peninsula and started chatting to winemakers down here and said, look, the wines I'm looking for are this or that with a Chardonnay and nice sort of buttery texture on the palate, and, or a Pinot that's sort of perhaps bigger in fruit uh, that doesn't taste like a cup of tea. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we then started working and ended up with a Chardonnay, a Mr. Bond Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, uh, then a Pinot Grigio, uh, and then a, a Miss Bond Rosé. Mm -hmm. And then my gorgeous daughter, uh, Amy, uh, had a, a, a boy um, called Louis Grange. That was his first two names, Louis Grange, and uh, here's another surname. Yep. And uh, I thought, what a great name for a wine. Yeah. <laughs> so I went and found a single vineyard rosé, which was start on from Mornington Blinch Shop, and called it Louis Grange. Mm. And, uh, and it was delicious. And that's kind of how it started. So I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on the wine industry, particularly around the Mornington Peninsula, but I guess in Melbourne uh, in general, but how much, yeah. how much it's grown over the years. And, and, oh, it's and massive. It's massive. Yeah. It's had its ups and downs. Um, Mornington Peninsula was very much, it was, it's a cool climate uh, wine area. And when I say cool climate, uh, the cool climate wine show, I don't know whether you know much about that, but the cool climate wine show is held each year on the Mornington Peninsula at Mornington Race Course. Okay. And they have over 700 entrants uh, of wines that enter in various categories. And being a cool climate uh, area, um, it first started off being Cabernet Sauvignon was one of the first crops grown on the peninsula. Uh, but unfortunately, it, didn't, it wasn't right. And um, eventually, they realised that Chardonnay, Pinot Noir are really other stars of the peninsula. And then Pinot Grigios and Gris sort of then came along. And now, of course, Rosé, which is uh, incredibly popular. And a lot of the winemakers down here are doing a brilliant version of Rosés from either, from either a, a, a Cabernet Merlot to a, a Grache or a Shiraz-based grape. So there's various styles. Uh, or a Pinot Noir, uh, again, from uh, which they blend into a, into a rosé. The wine this year has, 2019-20 has been horrible uh, season. Uh, the bushfires, yeah. uh, the pollution, etc., has really done a lot of hard work on, on, on vines. Um, the best year was around 2017 was the best year. In fact, that's when I won a gold medal for my Mr. Bon Chardonnay at the Google Climate Wine Show. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and because it was a brilliant year, everyone had a great year, whether it, be, it, doesn't, whether it was Barossa Valley or Hunter Valley or Western Australia, uh, even New Zealand had a, a great 2017, uh, which was sensational. And the wine game, um, in, particularly in the morning to the peninsula, I guess, but the Yarra Valley a little bit the same, it's become almost a tourism industry as well as a wine industry. Uh, well, I work very closely because my main clients are, are restaurants on the, and, and foodie pubs. Uh, uh, that's my main client base. And people like, so for example, Max's restaurant at Red Hill Estate. Uh, he was the first um, winery restaurant on the peninsula. 
and he's been there 25 years already. And again, it's interesting because uh, it's all about balancing food and wine together. It's not about, gee, this is a nice Chardonnay, but what does this Chardonnay go with? So all the restaurants, whether you're talking about Stillwater or Barn & Co, or whether you're talking about Max's Restaurant to, to, to others on the peninsula, they're all very supportive of, of the local industry, which, which is fantastic. The biggest problem we have on the peninsula is accommodation, though. Um, there's a lack of accommodation on the peninsula, which is a problem. And hopefully with council, uh, we've been having a, a conversation with council about maybe look at putting accommodation on some of the wineries where it's not offensive or not visually offensive. So that, that's the big issue at the moment. So tell me about the two. You pick two uh, from the Mr Bond range, one of each. Yes. Uh, and tell me about them. Okay, let's start with the, the Pinot Noir, Mr Bond mm -hmm. Pinot Noir. It's a 2017 Pinot Noir. It's, um, it's got bigger fruit uh, than traditional Pinots on the Mornington Peninsula, which is what the brief was to the winemaker. Um, it took us about three months. I used three different vineyards to blend the wine into one. And we experimented with 20% of this, 30% of that, 40% of this, etc. And after three months, we found the blend that really was the balance that I wanted. Because mm. to me, when you taste a Pinot, it's not a big Shiraz, it's not like a Shiraz. It has to be delicate on the, on, on the palate, but yep. also the fruit pops out on the end and stays with you. A lot of wines you tend to drink, or Pinot sometimes you tend to drink, just drop off completely yeah. and there's no, there's no aftertaste. I'm a huge Pinot lover and <clears throat> well, I, don't, I don't understand them, but I like them. I'm in that group of people who uh, I'm not a wine um, uh, expert by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but I love consuming yeah, having a, a drink of Pinot is, is like it places you anywhere in the world. It's that sort of drink. You know, you have it, you have a sip it, and you're going, I could, be in, I could be in France, I could be in wherever. Um, it, it sort of takes you to places. Mm -hmm. uh, as does the Chardonnay. Chardonnay has changed dramatically. Uh, the old days of Bin 65, Lindemann's Bin 65, which is big and woody, and, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like chewing a piece of wood. Yeah. <clears throat> These days it's called New Style, which is less less wood or, or French oak. And but we still use what we call pallets of French oak and where we put a little bit there so it's still got that nice buttery texture and the roundness on the palate. And but the end, again lovely fruit pops out, that sort of mango y type textures are coming through the wine. The, woody, the really heavy woody nature of Chardonnay is hard to drink. You know, because it, it was a few years ago, I was drinking some Chardonnays that were just really, really heavy and really woody. <clears throat> yeah. And didn't have that sort of, well, you describe it as buttery, but that sort of really fruity and, and buttery sort of taste. It was just, they were hard work is the way I described it at the time. They were just hard work. To yeah. Do. Actually, Napa Valley, uh, are, are still traditional uh, Chardonnay makers over there. Big, brown, a lot of wood, a lot of oak. Um, and... Um, and I had one a couple of weeks ago because I remember I used to like it to a certain extent. But a couple of weeks ago, a mate of mine bought a, an American one and I went, oh, no. It was, just, it was like, no, I don't want that anymore. I want something subtle and more elegant that I can, you know, savour on. And, uh, yeah, and right. so that was, that was good fun. William Bond, thank you so much for your time this morning. I really, really appreciate the chat. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm hoping 3MP will have every success as they will on the Mornington Fincher.